And uh, welcome uh, to this. Uh, can you hear me okay in the back? Is the volume okay? Yeah. Uh, welcome everyone um, to this session on um, natural resource corruption, how to research and address it um, here at the Bergen Exchanges. Um, it's my pleasure to uh, welcome and introduce um, Professor Louise Shelley. Uh, Louise is um, a professor at the Shah School of Policy and Government at George Mason University um, in the US. And she um, is the keynote today, um, talking from her book, Dark Commerce, How a New Illicit Economy is Threatening Our Future, um, which is just out with Princeton uh, University Press. Um, we also have a uh, distinguished panel. Um, Louise will speak first for around 30 minutes and has a presentation. Um, following that, I will welcome the panel up to the, uh, the stage and we'll introduce them. They will have around three to five minutes each to discuss uh, and respond to Louise's um, presentation. And after that, we will open out to questions from uh, myself or from the audience. I would prefer to have questions from you, but if you don't have many questions, then I will ask my own questions. So. Yes, please, Louise. Thank you. It's a, it's a great honor to be here. Uh, it's a wonderful community. And it's wonderful. Oh, dear. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. It's a great honor to be here. It's a wonderful community. And it's wonderful to be with a group of people who think in ways similar to mine and want to do something about this problem. So I always spend time on what we can do on this problem. But one of the core issues of dark commerce, apart from the role of cyber, is what is this new illicit economy doing to our future? And as I point out and we'll discuss more, the prime growth target of the illicit economy is now natural resources. Drugs is not as as central as it was to this illicit economy, but it is things that are undermining the sustainability of the planet. But we're not talking enough about it. So if you think about the re recent UN Global Assessment Report on bi Biodiversity and Ecosystems that was released in May, it warned of the extinction of one million species. It talks about ways to build more sustainability, how we need to work with the global and financial system, but it misses the key role of dark commerce and corruption and extinctions, which is absolutely central to why species are going extinct and what needs to be done about them. So I say it's like missing the 800-pound gorilla, which is our expression of how you're missing the most obvious thing. But this picture of the 800-pound gorilla has a double meaning. They're not only two huge gorillas that are part of a selfie, but the reason that they respond and they have these um, gorilla companions is that these are poor orphaned gorillas whose mother was killed in a poaching incident for, you know, for, f which is part of the extinction of gorillas. So they are not only what we're forgetting about, but they're also, as we can see, part of this serious problem of extinction of species. Many people um, think about what is behind this threat. And of course, we're going to talk about conflict in this meeting, but it is what I call a problem of dysfunctional selection. It has reached this, this problem of dark commerce. Such a large quantity of species that are being driven to extinction that we're talking about undermining Darwin's rules of natural selection. No longer are animals being chosen on being the fittest, but they're being exterminated as the fittest. And this dysfunctional selection is not only eliminating the species, but the people who participate in this slaughter of fish, of animals, 
are sometimes trafficked. They're individuals who are desperate individuals for a small amount of money and live in, in, in violent cultures in which they do not profit from the money they make from poaching. We just had a panel in which people were discussing increasing economic disparity in the world. And in Asia, with this enormous rise of middle class, in, in Asia, we have demand on many of the products that we are talking about. Trees to build houses, to build furniture, fish that is part of a middle class diet. And so we have a problem that I'm calling in this book a, a problem of a time-sensitive planet. And my past is very different from most of yours who work on maybe constitutional law. I've worked on criminal law and crime. And I grew up in Manhattan, which is brought me very close to the problem. So our famous market in New York is called the Fulton Fish Market. And the Fulton Fish Market in New York is controlled by organized crime. Because if you allow the fish to, sm to rot, if you don't pay off the mafia, you get a terrible smell, just like the garbage in, in New York, is, and is, as in many parts of Italy and elsewhere, is controlled by the mafia. So in time-sensitive industries, you have had the preponderance of organized crime. But now we have a time-sensitive planet where we don't have enough resources for seven and a half million, seven and a half billion people, many of them who are demanding middle-class lifestyles. And this is creating a time-sensitive planet and leading to the rise of illicit commerce. And we also have online platforms and especially social media, much that is encrypted, that is facilitating this trade. And this transformation that we're talking about is, is quite new. I mean, not for some of you who are, are young researchers, but for myself who's been looking at this phenomenon of transnational crime for about <laughs> 25 years, it is only in the last two decades that you can see this massive shift away from other types of illicit trade into those that are targeting the environment. So what are we looking at? And many of these you should be coming across in your research. For example, illegal deforestation, the charcoal trade that we, we see in East Africa, IUU fishing, which is a problem shared in many parts of the world that is depleting the, the fish off the coast of West Africa and leading to people being deprived of their income source. But in the US, a third of the fish that is brought in and labeled wild caught is a result of IUU fishing. We have illicit mining, which is going on in, in Colombia, in Peru, and some of that illicit gold is going to smelters in Florida. And there was just a recent indictment of an import business in Florida that was dealing in basically this conflict gold. And we're all part of this because coltan, which is part of our ubiquitous cell phones and computers, is often or mostly derived from basically trafficked labor working and, and mining it. We have problems of illicit pesticide and counterfeit seeds that are destroying soil and killing animals. We have illegal food and beverages. I went recently to... Um, a after a talk on illicit textile trade to a local restaurant around George Washington and they're selling a product called illegal mezcal. And what is illegal mezcal? It's mezcal that's made out of illegally um, harvested cacti in Mexico. So it's, it becomes hip, it becomes acceptable to be drinking this alcohol that is depriving the terrain of the cacti it needs to help ho hold the water. For those of you who are from India, you know about the pervasiveness of sand mafias and how they're destroying the, the coasts of India. In, we're talking tomorrow, I think it is, on, or Wednesday on water, 
but there are water mafias in India and Pakistan. And one of my doctoral students, who's now an assistant professor at University of Tokyo, did her research in Pakistan on the water mafias of Karachi that are charging exorbitant prices for water for people who can't afford it, can't obtain it, because they're not living in human rights cities. They're living in cities that are not looking after the welfare of their inhabitants. We're looking at wildlife poaching, which is going, and we have South Africans here who know about the trade in, Abel the trade in rhino, the trades in elephants, and recently we have an enormous growth of the problems of organized crime in Cape Town linked to the long-term trade in abalone that is going to China. But there's also, as we set up, remediation methods in, in Western Europe, like the carbon markets, those are being hijacked, often, and were hijacked through cyber crime, and there was an illicit trade in carbon markets. And this was not just done, it was done by criminals, it was done by terrorist groups because they found documents concerning this in the caves of the Taliban, but also it was done by Deutsche Bank officials, some of whom were prosecuted in Germany. And you also have had the illicit trade in, in, in diesel vehicles that were deliberately undermining emission standards. This here is the Lincoln Building in Seattle, Washington. And you may wonder why I am showing you a picture of the FBI field office. Well, the owner of this Lincoln Building is a man named Taib, who was a regional governor of Sarawak in Malaysia. And where did the money come from to buy this building? It came from the illegal deforestation of the area that he governed. 80% of this region displacing the indigenous population was done with the help of funding from Goldman Sachs, from Deutsche Bank that paid for this equipment, these roads, and the money wound up in, in part in Seattle, but money laundering into real estate. So one of the things that's very interesting is that this became part of a report by the General Accountability Office in the United States saying this is a national security issue. And this is how you get traction for this in the United States, is to talk about these environmental issues, not as an environmental threat, but as a national security issue. And the FBI renting its space from a kleptocrat who's destroying the environment is just illustrative of how we are undermining our security this way. <coughs> we have a legal charcoal trade, which many of you know about in studying problems in East Africa. The, there is a wonderful group in Norway working on the, under the UN Environmental Program that is identifying this rise of, event of environmental crime, and saying that it has a growth rate of 5 to 7 percent annually, much tied to organized crime and corruption. We have illegal fishing that is going on, and much of that is a competitor to Norwegian fishing. And why is it a competitor? Because as you can see, in Salt into the Sea, you have trafficked people, sometimes Rohingya, who are escaping conflict, who then become forced into the the fishing boats and are not paid. These are illegal stockpiles of pesticides in Africa. In India, it represents about 25 to 30 percent of the uh, market for pesticides, or illegally produced pesticides. Here is the trend in rhino horn poaching. You can see it's an absolutely exponential growth, and I have a whole chapter in my book on that. The decline in it is not only a result of the security actions of it, but the displacement of the rhino poachers to other countries around South Africa. And here we have the gaming admissions, the admissions in the Volkswagen. Here in the rhino is this case of dysfunctional selection 
where people are paid $5,000 to kill a rhino, but then they dissipate the money. This is an example of the convergence of different forms of illicit trade, where the permitting process was corrupted in South Africa, given to these women who were registered as hunters, but these were trafficked sex workers. And they then were registered as hunters and could legally poach, and the horns were exported. Here we have illegal <coughs> e-waste dumping that is a problem in many regions. And this is this mescal that I'm showing. And here you can see pictures of water mafias in different parts of the world. And here's a wanted poster of, for some of the suspected individuals involved in the carbon trade. So let's see about what you can do about this problem. First of all, we need to acknowledge that corruption and crime are absolutely central to it. And that may seem obvious, but that UN report on extinction and others are just ignoring the centrality of this issue to the problem. And if you don't define the problem right, then you don't define the, the solutions right. And we need to involve diverse stakeholders beyond just environmentalists. <laughs> because there are people who are engaged and concerned if you explain it to them that if they want their grandchildren to survive, then they need to think about the environment and the future. And we need to think about this as a transnational pr crime. Because if you can see, and I have maps in the book of how this money travels from Asia to offshore locales, to, to Seattle or elsewhere. It is a problem that we're all together in. It's not a problem of the developing world. It's not a problem of the developed world. It's a problem that brings us all together. And we need to work together on the community, as we were hearing about today in Bergen, with all of society, with journalism, with the tech community, and the finance community. And we may, must, as my last lines of the book conclude, we need people to understand that there are no jobs on a dead planet. You know, people are talking about how they need to use the environment for economic growth. Well, if there is no planet left to do this on, there is no economic growth. And this is something that we need to be talking to in a, in a very rational way, um, which is you know, I'm not usually always, like here, talking to an audience that is so convinced that needs to be done. I'm often talking to people who you have to bring along and convince of this. But what do we do? And I'll try and be, be quick of what we need to think about. In these assets, because this business is so massive, we're talking of the illicit timber trade of being literally billions of dollars that are laundered into Western countries through Western banks, that we need to think about how we can repatriate these funds in ways that they're not stolen again, but used for development. So that, and also to make people think about how it's in their cost-benefit analysis, they get more from encouraging tourism and encouraging wildlife than from killing it. Um, I think there's a very important, and I'm glad that movies are a very important piece of this. Is there? Uh, no, there are no more pictures. Mm -hmm. A very important piece of this because I think they play a very important role in ad addressing these issues. One of the things that I... Um, there's a new, a new film that has come out on called Sea of Shadows about the illicit trade in porpoises off of Baja, California, and what it is doing to the community and the violence and how the organized crime has diversified out of the drug trade into the natural resources because it pays even more. But some of it, of what can be done, is, is not as complex as you might think about. For example, on dealing with Indian pesticides, um, one of the people that I was 
I, I was in a residency program in, in a place called Bellagio, and one of the people with me was an Indian who had been involved in, in microfinance and developing cooperatives. And he was saying that one of the things that you can do by establishing cooperatives is that people who are more educated then can be buying the pesticides. You can be doing collective buying programs. And then people who are not educated, uneducated farmers are, are not being forced or out of ignorance buying things that are harmful to their soil, which is part of the reason that you have so many farmers committing suicide in India, because they're buying things that are killing their crops. So this kind of collective action in the community can be very powerful in, in, in protecting individuals. You can have co community education programs in Africa on pesticides and seeds and what you need to, to buy and what you need to be aware of. Just as we have lobster farmers off the coast of, of, of Maine that were studied by Eleanor Ostrom, who won the Nobel Prize for this work, on how you can get people to find a collective good and police each other not to over catch fish. You also need to think about how much this natural resources funds conflict. And a few years ago, I was invited to China. And I was told to talk there, because the Chinese are such large investors in Africa. So not to, they're not, you're not going to turn the Chinese into environmentalists. But if you're going to talk to the Chinese about what to do, you want to talk to them in their own interests, because we all care about our own interests, and that if the sale of these commodities is a case of dysfunctional selection, that it's promoting conflict, it's promoting instability, it's not good for their investments. And this makes sense to them, for people who are thinking in this way that this is a commodity that can cause harm, that can prolong conflict, that can prolong instability. And that's sort of the kind of argument that you need to be making to people who are not environmentalists like you. You have to make it in terms that make sense to them. You also need to help um, break down barriers. One of the things that our center did earlier was a project with Tanzanians bringing together Tanzanians who work on, um, on wildlife crime, but, not, but they'd worked separately on it. And now, after going through a sort of collective exercise like you're doing here, but with people who work <coughs> on, on law enforcement investigations, financial flows, they've been able to have an impact on some of this illicit trade in their animals and are working with others. So there are ways that you can empower champions to engage in this activity and fight this corruption. There are some people who suggest that we maybe need an international anti-corruption court because people are not being prosecuted for corruption in their own countries. As tech is such an important piece of this, because we may be thinking that we're hooked on our phones but elsewhere in the world, a lot of the communications that is going on that is facilitating this trade is going on through encrypted messages. Therefore, the tech community needs to be brought into this and sort of shamed into good behavior. One of the things that has been um, done is there are groups working within the tech community Google has worked on monitoring IUU phishing and put it, putting its technology to, to good. In the state of California, they have put in legislation in reference to human trafficking, but it could be expanded, making corporations that, sell o that have revenues over $100 million to be responsible for their supply chains and make sure that there's no trafficked labor within their supply chains. And so once you've done that in California, if you want, you can't miss a, a, a market of 40 million people, it has an impact throughout the country. So you can do things in one part of a country like ours where there are people resistant to this and basically force it by states that have different points of view. And, you can, and therefore, there's a whole movement now to be examining supply chains, 
and the origin of products, whether they're fish, whether they're um, gold, whether they're others to be responsible. We also need much more work in the tech area on using blockchain and others to prevent fraudulent permitting that's going through free trade zones. We have e-permitting in CITES, but it's not functioning because people are learning how to game the system. So in the end, I think that what we need to talk a lot more about also is the role of financial institutions and how we have responsibility as buyers, as, as shareholders. I mean, Norway has an enormous sovereign you know, wealth funds. You invest in businesses around the world. You can place responsibility on corporations that you're investing in and working with. And you can either encourage the behavior or you can shame this behavior. Um, one of the things that I'm deeply involved with in Washington and a community that I belong to of ending beneficial, of requiring beneficial ownership so that people understand who is behind the companies so that you cannot be laundering money through a shell company and buying the Lincoln Building in Seattle or selling off large parts of London to unknown individuals. So that we need to be demanding much more openness in our financial systems and of our financial companies. And to end one thing is that much of the money laundering that is going on in the world today is going on through something called trade-based money laundering. And what we're looking at is the results of the commodities of this illicit trade that are being laundered. Most of the money that came out of Colombia for drugs and other commodities was moved to Panama through trade-based money laundering. The latest scandals in the Baltics, um, one of them called Troika Laundromat, was all done through trade-based money laundering. So we need to be focusing on the elements of illicit trade that are allowing the, the kleptocrats of the world to move money and deprive citizens of their futures. And that money that they're often gaining for themselves is through the trade in the natural resources that we all need to live on to survive as a planet. Thank you. Thank you very much, Louise. Um, so I'd like to invite the panel to join us up on the, the platform here. So following uh, Louise's very rich presentation, we're very lucky to have um, a d distinguished panel with us, um, which I will introduce. And um, then everyone will be given three minutes, uh, three to five minutes to, to respond to, to what Louise has, has, um, has said. Um, so starting on the uh, right over there, uh, Mark um, uh, Robinson um, is executive director of EITI, the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative, which is a major policy initiative in the field of extractive industries, um, and has in certain countries also focused on forestry issues, I believe. But you can tell us a little bit more about that. Um, then uh, Saul Mullad. Uh, Saul is a senior advisor here at U4 and CMI. And he's involved in this um, targeting natural resource corruption project, which we are doing with, uh, with Louise. Um, then we have uh, Tina Serdaida, who's a professor at the Norwegian School of Economics and has written uh, quite extensively on corruption issues and uh, natural resources in the past. And um, Anwesha Dutta, who is uh, my colleague here at CMI and is a postdoc researcher on the targeting natural resource corruption project. So maybe if I 
could invite Mark first to, to, to provide a few remarks. And after we've heard from the panel, then we'll open up to, to questions and have a Q&A. Thanks very much, Aled. Um, pleasure to be here. Um, for me, it was quite an easy journey um, just coming up from Oslo, having previously been around the corner from Louise in Washington for the last few years and the World Resources Institute. So my background has pretty much been different aspects of governance through my career and in DC working on climate and environmental governance. And now I work in a very different sector, uh, on the extractive sector and trying to promote greater accountability and um, transparency in oil, gas and mining. Um, I can see some, um, both some similarities and some important differences in terms of those natural resources that Louise has been talking about. I must say, bringing this together in one place, in one book, is, is a critically important um, thing to have done at this juncture. Not least because, of course, it's huge financial significance, it's counter-development implications, and it's, as, as Louise brought out, it's direct implications for conflict as well. Um, I want to say a couple of things, one about institutions, one about technology, and then a third one about companies, and then a potential gap. Um, on, the, on the first, on institutions, um, I was thinking hard about what institutions are there that can help um, combat this illicit trade. And I'm sure you talk about it a lot in the book. But as I thought hard about it and the, the fact of illegality, um, there are actually very few formal institutions that can play a significant role in combating the trade. And I suspect that one that comes always to mind must be customs. Um, and I'd be curious to know how far investing in better, more efficient, less corrupt customs institutions has a role to play in terms of inspections um, and checking from point of procurement through to delivery must be a critical part of this. Um, and I, as I thought about other institutions, very few others came to mind. Um, I mean, of course, there's the legal environment and a legal process and how and in what ways laws can be used in a more um, determined manner to prosecute those found to be behaved in illegal, in illegal ways. But I suspect that's very much the tip of the iceberg, I'm sure, in practice. I'd be, again, curious to know, is how, you know what's the success of, of prosecu successful prosecutions of those um, transporting illegal um, natural resources on a large scale? A second point I had is, and it is about institutions, is the question of formalisation. And I think this is around one part of, of what Louise covers, um, namely artisanal and small-scale mining. You've referred, of course, quite rightly to the huge trade uh, and often illegal forms of mining in the artisanal sector. Um, uh, and one of the you know, slight points of light here, and something we are partly involved in, is how increasingly measures can be taken to formalise the trade as opposed to eliminate the trade. Because if elimination has massive adverse welfare implications, and of course, many of these things potentially have welfare implica uh, negative welfare implications, even if what's produced is in some ways extremely bad for the planet, it can oddly enough, also have short-term positive welfare implications. Now, formalisation is beginning to take place in, in parts of the ASM sector. Um, and so that for that, those parts of the trade um, that are not fundamentally illegal um, and can generate localised employment benefits on a more sustainable basis, it might be interesting just to think through what other aspects of formalisation uh, and bring in the, the dark trade into the open might be worth thinking through. On technology, uh, the parallels I was thinking about were twofold. One is uh, when I was at WRI, uh, one of the, um, the great um, initiatives they had there was Global Forest Watch using essentially Google technology to track um, illicit uh, destruction of forests, but also burning of forests. Um, uh, the, the nearest analogy I could think of, Louise, to the areas you cover probably would be lessons from Kimberley and illegal diamonds, which I think many people would argue is an incredibly successful initiative. 
um, and more recent efforts to do mineral tracing um, to show where minerals do and don't come from illegal sources of mining, just to take a couple of examples. So I was curious to know what else can you tell us on, on technology. And the last thing I'll say because of time um, is I'm really glad you mentioned beneficial ownership. Uh, it's one of the things we work a massive amount on and increasingly so. In other words, how do you identify the real owners of shell companies? This is very exciting. It, I think, has huge potential on the anti-corruption front. Uh, we at EITI are doing uh, an increasing amount to focus on helping build registers of um, owners of companies with national tax um, administrations. Uh, uh, and we're doing it mainly around the mining sector, where you can, f um, if you actually gather the information and put it in the public domain, reveal some quite extraordinary ownership structures that lie behind otherwise what look to be quite respectable, say, state-owned enterprises. How far beneficial ownership can be used to, to get at the, the, say, the trade in illegal wildlife, I don't know, um, because I suspect a lot of this doesn't operate on a large scale, or at least through large established companies. But I think it's really, really interesting to explore this. Another piece that we work on is co contract transparency. Um, and again, a lot of the trade you talk about doesn't involve formal contracts. Um, you know, are there innovations that can be explored around bringing uh, at least more of the, co the formal contracting process where it's almost that, that blurred area where between the, the legal and the illegal, mm -hmm. sometimes using contracts mm -hmm. to, to foster illegal trade. So is there anything more to be done around the contract transparency route? Finally, a question. Um, I was listening very hard to some of the potential solutions. One thing I didn't hear, hear refer to, maybe it's in the book, is the power of people's movements and citizen action. Oh, that's a huge uh, Well, I can't exactly have 20 minutes, so I was thinking, oh, wait, waiting for this one. So, yeah, uh, um, this, this must be critically important, and consumer movements presumably consumer are... Consumer movements in... Uh, yeah. Okay. So I've given you a long list there, Louise, but I think more provoked by the, the excitement that is, is generated by this important book. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Saul? Yes, thank you very much for that. Um, uh, oh yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you very much for that um, very very interesting talk. Like uh, Mark, I was also going to touch upon the role of um, uh, people's movements and civil society in uh, both raising issues and also addressing uh, these concerns. But one. Uh, issue that I really wanted to also raise, and I'm grateful to you for making this connection between these, uh, between the trade in natural resources and the climate emergency, essentially, that we are, you know, experiencing at this present time, uh, and the rates of global warming and, 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 and so on. Um, but um, my, my main uh, uh, question is really about the demand side mm -hmm. of, of things and how you uh, would see action towards halting uh, demand in illegal uh, products. So that's basically my main point. OK. Thank you. Uh, Tina. Thank you. OK. Um, so um, it's quite obvious that um, uh, corruption and, and um, what, well, many observers point at this problem as an interconnected, at the, some internet connected functionality between corruption and, and wildlife trafficking. Um, and, and many observers call for tougher enforcement, and they look at the anti-corruption, the world of anti-corruption, where we now have an, a myriad of tools uh, against foreign bribery, money laundering, embezzlement, and so on. Um, and what I was wanted to say something about is how will this work in the area of wildlife trafficking? Because mm. um, in the area of wildlife trafficking, we have these CITES regulations, and uh, which 
from, from, out, from the outside may look like a good set of rules, but at the same time, the enforcement is, is up to national mm -hmm. uh, governments, and uh, sometimes it functions a bit arbitrarily, and, uh, and players can bribe uh, those authorities to, 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 close, to condone the problem. And, and many observers call for some sort of merger between animal law and, and this anti world of anti-corruption tools. Um, and especially criminalization and, uh, of, uh, and uh, enforcement against international players. So in the area of anti-corruption, which I have followed more closely, um, we, have, we have hardcore rules. It is possible to hold players uh, responsible with imprisonment. It's possible. And as part of the conventions, state parties have committed to assist each other in the enforcement. And of course, that is something we want in the area of, of uh, illegal wildlife trade. Um, however, um, there are a lot of problems when it comes to international enforcement of these conventions. Um, many countries have signed conventions and they, there's very little enforcement. Um, very often they don't contribute to, to um, confiscate illicit funds that go through their own financial centers, not even in, in, in the most committed uh, countries, the most committed governments, rich governments. They don't contribute as much as, as they promise when they enter into these conventions. When we look at the enforcement practices of uh, foreign bribery regulations, uh, most countries have <laughs> enforce the, those rules in, in zero to three cases since mm -hmm. in the period of uh, 20 years since the conventions went into force. Um, when we criminalize, the burden of proof is very high on the, on the prosecutors. Um, and if we have, because you mentioned an international court of corruption as part one of the possible solutions, and and this is also something that may have some sort of post-colonial ambience uh, to it, which will reduce the moral cost for those who uh, collude, for, for poachers and, uh, and uh, guards who may collude. They may not care that much about rules coming from the north and so on. Um, so, so when it comes to, cr it's just a war <laughs> kind of concern because I see this as being discussed in many settings that criminalization and holding international players responsible. We have to get further in kind of, of making those rules function for illicit wildlife trade. Um, but the reality is that it's, it, it may look like a success if we get there, but it will ne not necessarily work, work the way uh, it is intended. So for these reasons, I think it is extremely important to work on the community consensus around protection of wildlife, that is one matter, uh, but also uh, one, of the, one of the lessons from the economics of regulation is that we have to regulate on what is observable uh, and, and these, uh, um, these um, uh, you know, fences, uh, what, what kind of transactions can we follow, what can be observed, what responsibility can be placed on the park owners and so on. Uh, the most <laughs> visible objectives for regulation are often the most, um, uh, most uh, functional. So I think instead of, of, of calling for international criminal, uh, we, we'll not, we will have criminalization, but instead of um, thinking that will be the solution, I think we need to have non-criminal measures and think about how they what they should look like. Thank you, Tina. Um, and Wesha, you have been doing field work on forest-related uh, corruption issues and human rights abuses in, in Assam. How does this look to you? Yeah, so um, thank you. And uh, thank you, Louise. It was really, um, what you're talking about are like really a broad spectrum of issues which we need to deal with now. I want to start by bashing capitalism <coughs> and growth for growth's sake, but 
that will not help any of us. So, um, so few of the things that I want to talk about, which comes from my own work, which has been on something called uh, green militarization. And basically, this says, it, it stems from this notion that wildlife trade supports the likes of, say, Boko Haram. But there is very thin evidence and th to support these kind of claims that wild wildlife trade is directly funding terror activities. Because this makes the whole argument very simplistic. And this has been pointed out by several political ecologists who have been working in this area. And the idea that terror groups like Boko Haram fund their activities through ivory poaching in Africa is a simple and compelling narrative for a lot of state um, actors, including the UN. But it has been adopted by governments, NGOs and the media, but it undermines wildlife conservation and human rights itself. Now, how? So in Cameroon and Nigeria, there have been studies that have shown that Boko Haram is actually using profits from cattle raids to support its activities, and they are plundering the countryside, and uh, cattle herders are the ones who are being affected by it, and it's not the trade in ivory. And to begin with, the most trafficked mammal in the world is the pangolin, and it's not the rhino or the elephant. So what is really going on here is that the wrong focus has implications for conservation because um, linking poachers and terrorists has led to a further militarization of conservation areas. More guns and guards have been sent into parks to stop these poachers. So the military approach has, you know, it has taken the form of shoot on site policies and other violent tactics that are carried out against these local populations who live around these uh, national parks. So law enforcement in protected areas is important for controlling poaching and terrorism, but this is not the perfect solution as Tina here is also talking about. And this has also been, you know, very evident in my own field research, where in order to tackle um, poaching, we are, you know, in, in this Kaziranga National Park, the forest guards have been uh, equipped with um, guns. And instead of actually shooting poachers, they have shot down, you know, uh, boys as young as 15 years old. Now... What, what has been the larger uh, academic discourse about this is framing the problem as a question of terrorist financing has helped to garner additional policy resources and it has been sold as a win-win for environmentalist and counter-terrorist. But this narrow lens has led to a predominantly militaristic approach. So what we should talk about rather is, is that... Um, that, you know, I do not say that force is not required in the policy response, but the long history of war on drugs and organized crime teaches us that going after low-level operators that can be easily replaced will do little to deter the kinpins. So we have to look at environmental crime as organized transnational crime. And that is where the larger problem lies, and that has been the emerging discourse. And, that's, and the other thing that I wanted to talk about is this, I am some who primarily does qualitative research using ethnographic methods. And then we have uh, other um, academics and policymakers looking at these larger global issues. And how do we navigate this space between micro, meso, and macro? So how do I use my insights, empiric insights, to make a difference and to even influence policy? And that is where I think a panel like this is useful where we can come together to bridge this very divide. Because often, as you know, Tina was talking about, so India is signatory to all these climate treaties, but on the ground, we have now uh, completely diluted our green clearance laws, which means within 100 days, we are giving big corporations to turn a forest into a special economic zone. So those are, I guess, the issues to look at, and the community here, because becomes absolutely important. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anwasha. Um, I want to give uh, Louise just a couple of minutes uh, if you'd like to say anything in response um, or any reactions, uh, and then we'll go to Q&A. Okay. So there's a lot of ways that tech can help, apart from what you were talking about of Google. There's TNARC, which we're part of, is partnering with WWF. Uh, Louise, oh, maybe sorry. you need to switch your mic on. 
TNARC is partnering with WWF, which has done some very interesting tech analysis of the fishing trade and the mirror trade of what countries report that they're exporting and others are importing. And as a result of this measure, you can see how there was one criminal who was working out of South Africa um, moving large amounts of rock lobster to, to Maine and moving the money offshore to, to Jersey. But, I mean, that was the investigation. But you could see a lot through the tech analysis of data. On this issue of, of conflict, uh, there was recently a study done by the U.S. government on data seized from computers, telephones, and others in East Africa. And they found a 70, with, with a terabyte of data, and they found a 75% convergence between the illicit drug trade and wildlife trafficking. So this is a part of a problem that we see of a, of a diversification of the drug trade into other activities. And so it is a much more, how do I say, it is not an issue of just looking at, at poachers, and this is not what when people are talking about an international criminal court of looking at poachers, but they're looking at very high level officials who are protecting this trade or um, engaged in, I'm, I'm not advocating a criminal justice perspective, but I have never seen people who are behind this advocating for using this against the individuals, but only against the top officials who are so part of the corrupt networks in their countries that they cannot be, um, be prosecuted. The demand side is a very, very serious problem because most of you, just myself included, don't even ask about the food that you're consuming and whether it is um, sustainable fish, whether this timber has been acquired from somewhere else. Um, there have been cases of a, a major timber company in the, um, in the United States called lumber liquidators that has been fined repeatedly for dealing in deforested forests of Russia where the Chinese are moving it through and selling it to the United States and that's called trade-based money laundering because they disguise the origin of this. So people have to be much more aware not only as a movement but as consumers. And that there are parts of the world and I write about this having spent a lot of my life working in communist states and then working on transformation, is that after you've lived in a society that has preached and imposed through authoritarian measures a very sort of ideological commitment to equality, people then, when they come out of these societies, have an enormous demand to live well. And, and this is driving a huge part of the market in China and Southeast Asia. And in some parts of it, it is even the endangered species that become the, the tribute that you give to somebody as an honored guest. So I think that we really have to think in ways of when you talk about civil movements, you know, where places are not we're citizens, many of the consumers of, of wildlife and of the products that we need are living in, in highly authoritarian societies and where, where corruption is pervasive. But it's a part of a story just the way this is beginning to unravel with the you know, post-deforestation of, of Sarawak comes out with the investigations also of 1MDB and the the hijacking of the sovereign wealth funds of Malaysia. But this is something that we all have to be part of, and it's not, as we were, were talking about here, of beneficial ownership. It's things that are sometimes sound very boring to ordinary people that are absolutely key in going after the money. And we all have to be responsible as, you know, as shareholders in companies and of demanding openness and consumer is, you know, demand is not only public protests and communications, 
but also of putting pressure on, on corporations to be responsible. Because while Google has done a lot on, um, say, phishing, it also lobbied in the United States not to be responsible for fighting human trafficking. So you've got to demand corporations be responsible citizens. Thank you. Thank you very much. I wanted to open out the, the discussion and, and invite uh, questions uh, from the audience. So I think there is a little device here which you can hold up to your uh, mouth and speak, and it will amplify what you say. Okay. So please go ahead. Okay. Well, I just... Maybe uh, if you could just introduce yourself before... My uh, name is say. George Queiroz. I'm from... I was born in Brazil. It's a very... Uh, it's a country with a lot of corruption. Yes. And uh, it's very serious, but it's being combated. But uh, it's very tough to, to fight corruption. But it's being dealt uh, with uh, by citizens. We're going to the streets since 2013 <laughs> to protest and stuff. But uh, my, I work on this area for many years, decades, and also as a researcher here here in Norway, and uh, I, uh, many people don't realize that corruption is genocidal. It's the killing of our own species because uh, 3.6 trillion dollars, according to the United Nations at least, is uh, stolen every year by the corrupt. This is official data. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of money. And because of that, that causes billions of people worldwide to be victims. All these people that you showed on your on your portrait. So the, the key issue for me is that the responsible parties, the center of the solution, goes through governments and the banking system because this money flows through the banking system, you know. So. Governments uh, from developed countries, from G7 and other countries, look to the other side as, as long as they benefit from the money. Take, mm -hmm. for instance, Switzerland. It's a well-known tax haven and financial haven. And then London, the city of London, yeah. some cities in the US, like Miami and many other cities. So when money, when your beneficiary of all these trillions stolen, Governments tend to look to the other side. So I think the pressure is on the government, governments. Because if they look to the other side, we're going to be here um, kind of feeling uh, useless. Because we feel frustration that all our efforts, because we see where it starts. It's, it's up there. I see it in Brazil. I see it in the US. I see. So you need that, and you need the. Uh, a uh, strong ju judicial system, good law enforcement. Uh, I wonder if you, if you share this. I would like to know your point of view. All right. I, I absolutely ag agree with you. Oops, am I on? I absolutely agree with you. One of the problems that one sees in, in Brazil at the moment is we had you had you know, major protests that wiped out the old system, and now you have a president who is allowing you know, illegal foresting in the rainforest. One of the issues that I was talking to a leading Brazilian judge in one of the major cities in, in Brazil is that most of these cases that are, that are occurring with deforestation they, their, their jurisdiction is in the, in the north, where the, the judges are part of the, the corrupt system and nothing is happening. And I was saying to him, but the money flows, must flow through Rio and San Paulo, and therefore can't you take jurisdiction over the financial side, because this judge is a specialist on money laundering. And I think this is a very important way of going, because there are very committed judges in, in, in Brazil to fighting corruption, but they need to think much more creatively about how to use the judicial instruments that they have 
because much of this crime connected to natural resources involves corruption and could be handled in this way, but it's not at the moment. There are no cases of in any of the courts in San Paulo or Rio connected to the corruption with forest reserves. Okay, I see a hand up at the back. I also saw a few other hands here. Could you just put your hands up again if you have... Uh, yes, okay, the lady with the mic, uh, with the okay. box. Hi, my name is Sophia Johnson. I'm a postdoc at the Department of Administration and Organization Theory. And my research concerns... Uh, so international. Can you speak up loud? Yes, of course. My research concerns uh, international police collaboration on online platforms to counteract transnational sex trafficking. So it's so inspiring to listening to you, all of you. Uh, and I have just one question, which might be a bit outside the scope of today's panel, let's see. And it concerns, first of all, like social norms and values. Mm -hmm. So the connection between uh, corruption and environmentalism. So basically, like, who are the people who are kind of against protecting the environment and who are more corrupt, corruptive. Uh, and that leads me to my second question, which is about gender and corruption. And uh, like as we, today, as we speak, like the, the large proportion of uh, police forces are basically men. And we know that there have been attempts to like reduce corruption by employing female police officers in several countries. So I just wonder if you could say something about the role of gender perhaps in this and the connection between uh, values of environmentalism and, uh, and corruption, perhaps, if that's not outside of the scope, of course. Yeah. Thank you. I know Saul has written something recently on social norms in particular and corrupt. Do you want to maybe say something? Yeah, sure. Um, I can also a little bit about um, gender and corruption in the police force as well. Uh, based on uh, last year, we held an event here called Corruption and Communities in South Asia, and we were very lucky to have Sadaf Ahmed present actually on this issue of corruption uh, in the uh, Pakistani police force. And um, her, her work actually showed... Um, quite an interesting system uh, that essentially mirrored the institutional corruption from a sort of male perspective within the uh, police force and that women were equally, or women police officers were equally uh, integrated into that system. So that's maybe something of interest for you to, to study. Um, on the issue of uh, social norms and corruption, of course, there's a lot of work that is now emerging on this subject. Um, and of course, we have to move away from any kind of sort of uh, belief that there is one universal norm of corruption and instead look at how uh, different social pressures may actually contribute towards corrupt behavior. For example, uh, family pressures or uh, pressures to achieve social status or what have you that actually push people into uh, relationships of corruption. And I think, um, uh, yes, I mean, they can also promote uh, uh, conservation, right? For example, uh, taboo in uh, Madagascar, uh, which is related to uh, prohibited spaces that have been prohibited by ancestors has actually led to the uh, preservation of certain species and certain areas of forest, which is remarkable considering the massive deforestation in, in Madagascar. So these types of things are quite interesting entry points that could be uh, expanded upon by practitioners, uh, you know, to, to develop uh, a more kind of uh, local, locally oriented uh, approaches towards preservation and reducing corruption. In, in the book, I talk a, a little bit on this, of course. As a woman, how could I not talk about this issue? But in many of the patrols that are going on to, to save animals that women are being recruited for, there's finding you know, less, less abuse by the rangers, less possibilities of corruption, and it's also valuable in that it brings women income into their 
into their families, and therefore they see a trickle-down effect from protecting the animals. I think also, when I write on this issue, I say there's a lot of lessons learned from what is going on in fighting human trafficking um, that could be applied in this area as well. And one of the concerns is, as you could see in that, that, that poaching photograph of the rhino, that you have a convergence of, of, of trafficking for sexual exploitation with rhino trade, but there are many more connections to, to labor trafficking. In the case that was prosecuted out of South Africa with the rockfish, rock lobsters, it turns out that there were a group of women that were trafficked from South Africa to Maine in a labor situation to deal with these um, harvested uh, rock lobsters. So th the phenomena are not as separate as they seem, and many of the strategies and the willingness to do things in that area should be applied and transferred to this area. There are a lot of insights. I could go on for a long time. I won't, but... Okay, thank you. Yes, I saw Malcolm. Uh, um, somebody with the box already. Yes, yeah, please. Um, go ahead. I'm Marta Machado. I'm a law professor from Brazil, and I'm uh, profoundly concerned about corruption but I'm also profoundly concerned about the, the moralizing discourse about corruption uh, and how it's being used very populistically. And if you see what happened in Brazil, and it has become very clear after the leaking of the conversations between Judge Moro and Prosecutor Dallagnol, the process, the, the, Lava, Jato, uh, the Lava Jato process uh, has stepped uh, the limits of rule of law and is clearly now considered a very partial and uh, a very partial process and has been used uh, and mobilized for political reasons. So I think, uh, so in, in envir environmental uh, issues, the result of an anti corruption initiative mm -hmm. led to the most disastrous. Mm -hmm. Consequences mm -hmm. uh, led to the election of a populist leader, a far-right populist leader, uh, led to uh, 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 increased polarization of society. Uh, from the time Bolsonaro uh, is in power to now, deforestation increased mm -hmm. to more than 200 yes. percent. Yes. Uh, so my concern is, of course, uh, we have to fight corruption, and I'm totally in favor of. Uh, using uh, criminal law and developing mechanisms to fight corruption, but it's also time that we revised our uh, discourses, uh, the international organizations, the World Bank, and the International Academy, uh, to to have a more sensitive approach approach to how corruption. Uh, and corruption fighting can be manipulated for political ways, mm -hmm. and we can we and and how we oh, have to yeah. fight corruption within the rule of law uh, standards. Thank you very much. That's a very interesting contribution. Yeah, Do you want? Yeah. Yeah. So um, thanks for that because we have witnessed something very similar in India, and India had like one of the biggest civil movement led by Anna Hazare on corruption, mm -hmm. which anti-corruption, not uh, whatever. Um, and that led to the coming of like a political party in Delhi, which no one even knew about. However, what it also did, as you rightly point out, corruption now has been framed as national interest. And it has been uh, like it almost has been um, framed in a nationalistic narrative for which Narendra Modi came to power and he did something called the demonetization uh -huh. specifically to address corruption, black money and terrorism. Mm -hmm. But the result of that is that uh, the poorest of the poor suffered and very little black money actually came into the economy because most of that money was invested into real estate and other things and there probably wasn't that much black money to begin with. And this probably, what you are also saying, points at the inherent flaw of a 
of an extremely law enforcement, criminal driven process and not taking into account the local realities of these really huge brick nations. So, yeah. Well, it, this is not just a reality of a brick nation. Okay. I mean, our, our, our president in the U.S. ran on a... No, ro no, ran on a campaign of drain the swamp, yeah. Yeah. an anti-corruption campaign, and now he's launching anti-environmental yeah. practices. This is not just a problem in the developing world. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think we have time for one last question. I saw a hand up in the back. Is it still... There are two hands. You will defer to your, your colleagues. Yes, please. Um, thank you. Uh, my name is Melody. I'm from Vest University in South Africa. My research is also in the area of criminal law, but particularly cyber security and cyber crimes. So I wanted to find out from you because through my research, I've realized that a lot of illicit trade and a lot of criminal activities are now taking place online and in the dark web. So I wanted to find out have you done research in that area and what are the laws in the US governing or criminalizing conduct that, that's not happening in the physical world but rather in the dark web? And then in addition to that, we were talking on corruption and how lo uh, people in political positions and positions of influence look the other side when it comes to money laundering. And now we have cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin which is a new form of people are using it for money laundering and financing of terrorist activities. So I wanted to find out from you what is being done in, in the US because in South Africa there's uh, nothing that's currently being done to regulate use of cryptocurrencies or crypto assets. Yeah. That's another talk. I mean, there's so much to say. I have a large chunk of the book on the cyber world, dark dark commerce, where the illicit activity is going on in the deep web as opposed to the dark web and the regulation of it. I'd be happy to send you more, but I, I, it's really a long discussion. Okay, well then I think I will open for any last remarks from anyone. No, are you all good? Yes. Let's save the planet. Let's save yeah. the planet. Yes. Okay, that's the exactly. good takeaway. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, well, I just want to thank um, the panel very much for um, contributing. Um, we have a, a mug for you, which I will hand to you just now, and uh, all of you for joining. Thank you very much.